Okay, let's go ahead and get started. It looks like someone had turned the mic down, uh, but I think we're set up now, and I believe the camera is recording today. Uh, I guess we'll find out when we see uh, the video that we end up with. Um, so uh, let me mention a little bit about uh, where we're at. Um, so uh, uh, homework five has been released, you know, and it's due this Thursday. Then we're switching into midterm mode. So there, there is not a new homework that's going out this week. The next homework will go out next week. So we're switching into midterm mode. I released all of the materials on Monday. So on the exams page, you will find uh, there's a, a description of the structure of the test. There's a sample midterm and the key, a cheat sheet that will be available to you. Uh, a resource of old exam questions, just the questions, not the answers, but it gives you something uh, if you're interested in having some problems to work on. Um, the, uh, uh, if you go to practice it, a lot of these problems are in practice it, and it would allow you to kind of check and see if your answers are correct. So then there's the actual midterm itself and the key, and again, I said don't look at the key until after you've taken the test. Give yourself 60 minutes to take the test. Uh, upload it using the link that's here. Uh, you'll be scheduling an appointment with your TA to spend 15 minutes discussing uh, how you did on the midterm uh, and uh, where you're at in the course. It's kind of a good uh, way of assessing uh, your mastery of that early material uh, and uh, uh, getting uh, in touch with your TA, you know, in, in case there's any issues, the TA might be able to help you uh, if there's kind of something that you need a little more uh, uh, help with uh, before we, we go forward. I am going to release a bonus assignment. It's only worth two points. It's, this is, this bonus assignment is not something that is meant for people to kind of uh, up their score. It's a measly two points. It's more if there's anybody who's interested in exploring the issue and you have a little extra time. So on Friday that'll be released, this bonus homework that's worth two points. It explores the use of inheritance to do a variation on what we've done before uh, uh, with the uh, hangman manager. It kind of follows up on some things that I'm gonna to discuss today in the lecture. Uh, so today I'm gonna to be covering some uh, material. I'm gonna talk a little more about inheritance, uh, pick up a kind of a miscellaneous topic, uh, tell you a little bit about the midterm questions and how people have performed in the past. And Friday, I'm going to be going over uh, a sorting technique that's very important to understand. Uh, I, you shouldn't get through a course like this without having seen uh, a, an efficient sorting algorithm, and so that's what we'll do in Friday's lecture. Monday is an optional lecture, so I'm going to be lecturing on quicksort, which is a, a different sorting algorithm than I'll be covering on Friday. And that one is truly optional in the sense that, you know, it's for people who are interested in the topic and kind of seeing a little bit more, but uh, I, I, I'm not expecting that everybody's going to want to watch that lecture. A lot of you are going to want to be switching into the midterm mode and using that time uh, to uh, uh, practice, to take your exam, and to meet with your TA. So Monday's optional lecture, Wednesday we start back with uh, lectures that will be uh, relevant for homework six, which will go out at the end of next week. So uh, I show you here kind of the structure of the test. I wanted to switch to the uh, overhead camera for a little bit. I have something I wanted to show you there. So let me try to make sure that I'm looking at the same thing that you're looking at. So I want to do a couple of things on, uh, on the, the document camera. One is I wanted to talk about the different midterm questions. So this is actually average scores that I've gotten uh, for, I guess that goes back seven years, you know, for various midterm uh, questions that I've been asking. Uh, and actually this column right here uh, is the results that I had when I gave the midterm that I'm having you guys do. So uh, I usually aim for an average of 80. So this was very close to what I was aiming for. Uh, this, this is a, a pretty ideal test. Uh, your sample midterm was a little harder than I like. That's kind of the results from the sample midterm. And I believe this is the results for some of the questions that are listed for tomorrow's section. The TAs are going to be going, doing their own review with you tomorrow for the midterm. Uh, and I, I believe those were the scores for those particular questions. So I was going to spend a few minutes to just go question by question and say a few words about each uh, 
so recursive tracing, we've, we've seen these kinds of problems. I show you some code and I ask you what output is produced or what value is returned for various kinds of calls. 15 point question. I used to get really high scores on this so that it has an overall average over time of 90%. But recently I've been able to ask somewhat harder questions and this one was a little tricky, this one that, that's on your test. Uh, it had an average uh, that was closer to 80%, you know, score. Uh, so, uh, but you know, still relatively high for the, for the recursive tracing. Recursive programming, you can see over time, has had a, a lower average, 69.3%. So this is good, I'm gonna ask you to write a recursive method. Uh, we had the two different sections on recursion, and that second section had examples of recursive programming questions. Um, there, they, a lot of students uh, struggle with the recursive programming question. Show us what you can show us, I and mean, you can always write a header. Often there's an exception that you're supposed to deal with. Uh, often you can identify the base case, or there may be more than one base case, just by reading through the problem. All of those are worth points. So even if you kind of don't see the recursion, show us what you can show us on a question like that. Uh, and obviously if you can do the recursive case, that would be uh, helpful as well. Uh, the TAs gave you their own advice about recursive programming. I find it helpful to make a table of different kinds of uh, different calls and what they produce and trying to figure out the relationship between different entries in that table. You know, if it's something that involves an int, is there some relationship to the call on 10 versus the call on one of the lower uh, values in the table? So uh, that's the recursive programming. Inheritance we talked about in the Monday lecture. Scores tend to be relatively high on this one. Uh, the TAs went over it with you in section uh, yesterday. Uh, remember, you have to understand the polymorphism idea, and there may be calls on super. You know, so those were things that uh, you know we we did not include when this was covered in the 142 class. The linked list problem uh, is uh, list nodes. You know, it's a before after a set of before and after pictures. Uh, that's one where I think practice really helps. The more you practice, the better you're going to get at it. I think it's, it's uh, useful for you to be able to write that kind of linked list code. There's going to be a programming linked list question on the final. And so you know, doing the before after pictures on the midterm is kind of good preparation to make sure that you remember how all of that works. The scores tend to be fairly solid on that particular question. Array int list, um, this one, it, you'll notice it has the, the lowest overall average of all of the different questions. I don't know whether that's because it's been a while since we talked about array int list, or maybe it's just there's, you know, a little, you know, the, sometimes these are tricky kinds of things. Remember that the array int list has a field called element data, which is the array that stores our data, and it has a size field that tells you how many values in that array are currently in use. Typically, there's some minor change to make to the array, like shifting things you know, a little bit uh, in one direction or another to say add something or to remove something. Um, the, uh, uh, one of the most common errors that people make on this array int list programming question is they forget to update size. If the list has changed in size, like if you've added or removed, then you need to remember to update the size so that that will be remembered uh, for later. So uh, array int list would be worth practicing a little more, uh, apparently, because people struggle a little bit with that. It's important to be able to do array-based coding, uh, and we're kind of testing it there. The stack queue, you can see the scores kind of vary somewhat wildly here. Uh, and I think that has to do with whether people kind of see how to do the stack queue question. Uh, this one had a pretty, a pretty reasonable uh, average score of 18, but you can see this is one also where you know, the scores are a little bit lower than other scores on the test. So the stack queue tends to be challenging for people. Uh, again, show us what you can show us. Obviously a header is a useful thing to do. We ask you to use a temporary structure. So constructing that temporary structure is a useful thing. There's often things like moving things from a stack into a queue, moving things back from the queue back into the stack. There are often issues of if you don't do things in quite the right way or you don't have the correct loops, sometimes you end up with things in reverse order. So sometimes you have to do an extra uh, moving things from say the stack back to the queue and then from the queue back to the stack again. Uh, in the lecture, I was using methods called queue to stack and stack to queue. Those aren't available to you on the test unless you were to write those methods on your, on your uh, 
paper. But you'll see that you know, the, the key that I show to these things, I tend to write a whole lot of little loops, little while loops that transfer from stack to queue and from queue to stack. So it's not that hard to write those loops uh, during the actual exam. But it's worth a big chunk of points. Uh, leave yourself enough time. Don't, don't uh, kind of uh, leave yourself just a short bit of time you know, by, by lingering on the other questions. Uh, it's, it's the most points on the test, so you want to have enough time uh, to be able to work on that one. Uh, and think it through carefully uh, what to do. Normally I'd ask for questions and I'd probably get a lot of questions, but uh, we don't have that option. Maybe you'll use the Q&A option uh, to ask me some questions. So I'm uh, switching gears then. So one of the things that I wanted to do today is I wanted to talk about binary search. I normally do this in an earlier lecture, but I knew that we had kind of this extra lecture available to us. And so I decided that I'd rather uh, uh, move this to, the, the, to today's lecture. Uh, and I'm going to do something that I don't normally do with binary search, uh, which is I'm going to write the code with you. So we'll do a little bit more than we normally do. And it's a little dangerous because I actually haven't written the binary search code uh, during a lecture uh, before. So it could be that, it, that I'll screw up wildly and it'll be very embarrassing. But uh, uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how that turns out. So binary search is an important algorithm to understand. My guess is that most of you already know about binary search, so probably the, 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 what I'm about to say is review, but it's worth pointing it out anyway. The idea is that if you have, say, some sequence of values stored in an array, and if you know that that sequence of values is in sorted order, then you can search it in a very efficient manner. Uh, in particular, what we, what we saw in the uh, array int list class when we wrote index of is it started an index variable you know, at the very beginning at the index zero and then it bumped it up by one, bumped it up by one, bumped it up by one, bumped it up by one. That's known as linear search. And when we talked about the idea of complexity, I mentioned that linear search has a complexity of O of N because uh, if it's a failed search, it has to look at everything. And even if there's one occurrence of it, on average, it'll look at half of the things. So that other technique, the linear search algorithm, uh, is an O of N. Uh, this is a nicer uh, uh, approach to use. Um, in the 142 class, we tend to give this programming assignment that's a guessing game. Uh, and so you may remember the guessing game program where uh, we say, you know, that I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 100. Uh, so, you know, uh, what, do you, what do you guess? I mean, kind of the bad approach to this would be, I guess, 1. And it, it, because in that game, you're told whether the answer is higher or lower than what you've guessed. So suppose you guess 1 and they say higher, 2, higher, 3, higher, 4, higher, 5, higher. That's doing a linear search, which would be a, a stupid way of doing things. You know, the way to play that game is you guess 50. So you're kind of always looking in the middle. You would guess a 50. Uh, and then they tell you whether it's higher or lower. And by doing that, you're able to kind of eliminate half of the possibilities. Like suppose you're told it's lower. Well, then you have half as many things as you had before to look at. And now you kind of consider this range right here. So uh, that's the idea, is it cuts in half every time how many possibilities there are to consider. So if there are n things uh, in, in the, the sequence, you know, you cut it in half with one guess, you cut it in half with another guess, you cut it in half with another guess. So kind of how many times do you have to divide by two uh, to get down to one guess? You're kind of asking n divided by two to what power gives you a one? Or another way of saying that is, n is uh, 2 to what power is kind of the way we would think about it. My hope is that you would remember from uh, K-12 math that that question mark is by definition the log to the base 2 of n. Uh, and so uh, we would say that the number of guesses that you have to make is on the order of log n. Uh, all uh, logarithms are a constant factor away from other logarithms. So log 2, log 10, log 18, it doesn't matter. Uh, all logs are the same. So uh, this binary search algorithm, we would say, is a log n algorithm. Uh, how good is that? Well, uh, one of the approximations that I like to remember is that 2 to the 10th is around 10 cubed. Uh, this is 1,024, this is 1,000. So they're pretty close to each other. Uh, and so if you, were, if you were trying to guess 
a number in a list that had a thousand elements in it, you would expect it would take you around 10 guesses. So a thousand things, 10 guesses. If it were a million things, 10 to the sixth, this would be two to the 20th. So a million things takes around 20 guesses. A billion things takes around 30 guesses. A trillion things takes around 40 guesses. So even, you know, when n becomes a trillion, you know, the, the number of guesses is still very well behaved. So that's why this is such a, a great algorithm to know. Uh, when you have something in sorted order, you obviously want to use the binary search approach. Uh, we're going to write the code in just a minute. So let me say kind of the way that this code works is we, we kind of keep track of a low and a high index. And all of our attention is going to be on the midpoint of that. Well, just like the 50 up here, kind of the halfway point. So we're going to find the midpoint between low and high and look there. And we're going to see, is that the value that we were searching for, in which case we found it. Uh, and if it's not the value that we're searching for, we see how the value that we're searching for compares to what's there uh, 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 at that spot. And so we either kind of scooch up low or scooch down high to eliminate half of the possibilities. Uh, we eventually, uh, if, if, you know, suppose we, we're not going to find it. We eventually are going to kind of reach a point with this sequence of values where low and high are equal to each other. And so when low and high are equal to each other, I mean, that's actually not, uh, that, that, that could be a, a reasonable uh, position to be in. That would be uh, storing basically a sequence of one thing. And it could very well be that that one thing is the thing that you're searching for. So low and high being equal to each other, uh, we might still need to check kind of what's there at that midpoint. Uh, but then what we want to allow to have happen is we want low and high to pass each other. So we kind of want to have it be the case where we reach a point where uh, high is over here and low is right next to it here. We want to allow the high and the low to cross. That's when we would stop. That's when we would know that there's nothing left to look at. So that's kind of our ending position. When high and low have crossed, we know that there's an empty sequence, that there's nothing left to consider. Well, there's an interesting case that comes up, uh, or an interesting issue that comes up. So uh, one of the standard conventions is that if you don't find something that you're searching for, you return a minus one. Uh, that's what the uh, index of does, the linear search does, and we could do that here too. But there's an interesting uh, alternative, which is uh, suppose somebody did a binary search and they found that this value was not in the list. They might want to know where it belongs in the list. So uh, there's the notion of an insertion point, the insertion point. So uh, we might want to tell uh, the person where this value that we would be adding uh, should be placed. And you know that what's going to happen when we add something is we're going to shift values up. So uh, uh, you know this is something that would you have to kind of uh, convince yourself or do a little bit of testing to convince yourself. But let me just kind of point out that low is storing the index of the insertion point. Because when we go to do an insertion, we want it to be inserted in between these two positions right here. So the variable low actually tells us the insertion point. But how do we, how do we tell a client about the insertion point? How would we distinguish between saying, I found it at index six versus it belongs at index six? Well, the idea is that we return minus the insertion point. So we return a negative number that's minus the insertion point. So if it belonged at, at, at index six, we would return a minus six. But that doesn't quite work because if it belongs at zero, minus zero and plus zero are the same thing. So uh, the convention that's used is to return not minus the insertion point, but minus the insertion point minus one. So even one lower than that. So if the insertion point is zero, where it should be placed is a zero, we return a minus one. If the insertion point is a one, you know, we should be putting it at a one, we return a minus two. In my example where the insertion point was a six, we return a minus seven. So we kind of subtract one from the negative insertion point and return that value. Well, that's what I wanted to talk about on the pad. Let me switch back to the computer.
And I, I didn't show us our question of the day, so let's take a look. Summer quarter. Uh, I was surprised there were as many of you who aren't sure what you, you know, what you might do for summer. So that was kind of interesting, and a fair number of you planning to take some summer courses. I wanted to show you something that is in the arrays class, that there's a binary search method. This is the one we're going to write. It takes an integer array and a value to search for. Uh, and uh, if we kind of take a look at the description of it, it's describing what it does. And when it describes what it returns, notice that it points out that it returns minus the insertion point minus one. So that's exactly that thing that I was saying there on the pad, uh, is that that's kind of the convention that's used, and we're going to do that in the code that we write. So let me switch over to JGrasp. And I've written some code that uh, uses a random object to uh, put some various numbers into an array of length 30, and we print it out. Uh, and then it's going to call a method binary search that's searching for data after it sorts that array of data. So I'm using arrays.sort to do that. So our task is to write public static int binary search that takes an integer array that I'll call list and it takes a value that you're searching for. So that's the method that, we're that we need to fill in to kind of complete this program. So I mentioned that we're gonna be working with a low and a high, and initially low would be the beginning of the array, a zero, and high would be the last element of the array, which would be list.length minus one. Um, you can, you'll, you'd see if you look in the Java version that there are variations of binary search that take indexes. So not just an array and a key, but a from index and a to index. So you, we, can, we could kind of generalize this so that low and high could be parameters that you pass. That's a common thing. But we're gonna write the simple version where uh, it's the entire array that we're searching through. So what did I say? I said that we wanted low and high to cross. So uh, what would indicate that we're not done while low is less than or equal to high, we're not done. And all of the focus is on the midpoint. So I'm gonna compute a mid, which is low plus high over two. Uh, and if list mid is the value that we're searching for, then, then great, that means we found, the, we found the spot where it belongs, we would return mid, because that's where, that it's, that's, it's right there. That, that's the value that we were searching for. Uh, otherwise, what we would do is we would see kind of how list mid compares against that value. So suppose list mid was less than that value. That means that the value belongs in the upper range because the, the, the value there at the midpoint is less than the value that we're trying to add. So that would mean that we want to kind of scooch up low so we could set low to be mid. Uh, and otherwise what we would do is we would scooch down high. So we kind of always change one or the other. I had a friend who, uh, who worked uh, at Google. She told me that um, she, when she interviewed uh, students, you know, potential employees, she liked to ask them about binary search. And every one of them knew how to describe binary search. But she said that then what she would do is she would ask them to code it. And she said that only about half of them were able to write code that worked. Uh, I told her she was on, on, on the track for a binary search for finding employees. She's got a way to cut out half of the population by seeing whether they can write the code for binary search. Uh, I have written incorrect code. I have written code that isn't going to work, uh, kind of on purpose. This binary search is somewhat um, infamous for being hard to write correctly. Uh, but uh, uh, let's, let's go ahead and, and see. Let, let me try compiling it and running it. And uh, it, it made up an array called data, put a bunch of values in it that it put into sorted order, and now it's at the part of the main program where I'm going through a for loop. It's, it's in a call on binary search, but it's in an infinite loop. Basically, we're here in an infinite loop. Uh, so I'm gonna end this. So uh, it is true that we wanna kind of reset the, mid, the, the low or the high based on the midpoint, but think about that case you get to where low and high are on top of each other. They're, where, they're, where they're kind of both at the same spot. Well, then the midpoint will also be at that spot. So resetting low and high to be mid is setting it to what they already are. 
that's kind of the basis of the, of the infinite loop, is when we get down to low and high being equal to each other, then mid will also be equal to low and high. All three will be equal to each other and we'll be stuck there in an infinite loop. Well, if you've checked list mid to see whether the value is there, you know that it's not at the midpoint. So you know that we can do better than setting low to mid, we can set it to mid plus one. And we can do better than setting, when we scooch down the high, we can do set better than setting mid, uh, high to be mid, uh, the mid, we can set it to mid minus one. We can kind of, sh one further, one beyond, because we know that list mid doesn't have the value. So that turns out to be an important thing to do in order to have code that's going to work. Let's try compiling and running it. And uh, what it's saying here, uh, it made an array. Uh, the value 6 is at index 0, which is good. The value 8 is at index 1. It's indicating that all of these other things, remember uh, the insertion point is you know, uh, uh, minus one, uh, minus the insertion point. So this is indicating that the value that we would insert belongs at index, oh, actually, no, it's not. Uh, this is all returning minus ones right now, because that's all I did, is I kind of did the minus ones. I haven't done the insertion point part yet. Uh, let's do that. So instead of returning, that was just returning minus one. Uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to say that low ends up storing the insertion point so we return minus low, but remember we have to subtract one from that. Minus low, I mean, minus the insertion point, minus one is what we end up returning. And so if we compile and run this version of it, and I'm having it make, use random numbers each time, so we get a slightly different array every time. So uh, five is at index zero. All of these, you know, by returning a minus one, now it really is <laughs> indicating the insertion point. That's one less than the insertion point. So it's saying the insertion point was zero. So all of these values would be inserted at zero, which would be the right place to insert them so that they would go in front of a five. If you wanted to have a six, it would belong. So this minus two is one less than the minus insertion. So the insertion point is a one. It's saying a six should be added at index one, which is correct. That's where we'd add a six for it to be in the right spot. And then we found this at index one, we found this at index two. It's saying that, uh, that for a value of nine, we have a minus five. So that's minus insertion point minus one. That means the insertion point is four. It's saying that a nine should be inserted at index four. Zero, one, two, three, four. This is the value that's at index four. It's saying that's where you would insert a nine. And I think you can see that's the right spot to insert a nine. So uh, the code worked. Uh, uh, we, didn't, we, we fixed the infinite loop by uh, uh, updating a little better than just using mid. And it has that uh, extra feature of kind of being able to deal with the insertion point. All right, so I, I, will, I will post this code to the calendar for today in case you're interested. I want to use the, the last bit of the class today to go over a few examples of inheritance and some interesting things you can do with inheritance. So Monday's lecture you could think of as the annoying aspects of inheritance, that the kind of what are some of the problems that come up and the issues that you have to deal with in terms of variables of one type and objects of another type. And one of the questions was, why would you ever want to have variables of one type and objects of another type? Well, some of these examples today will make that a little bit clearer of why you want to be able to do something like that. Um, I've got a class here that I'm, I've called stuttered list. I wanted to mention an idea, which is there's a, there's a phrase that people often use when they're talking about inheritance, what inheritance allows you to do in, in, in object-oriented programming, which is additive, not invasive change. So um, let me describe this problem, because this is a good little example of this problem. Uh, I've got a, you know, a, some standard code here. It looks like what we've been seeing all quarter long, right? I, may, I set up an array list. I add some things to it. I print it. If I compile and I run it, you'll see that it does kind of exactly what you'd expect, four score and seven years ago, uh, the kind of code we've been writing. What I want to do is I want to have a new kind of list object that's a variation on this list. So uh, inheritance is good for variations. That's kind of one of, the, one of the other ways of thinking of it, is that inheritance is particularly good at variations, kind of defining variations of things. So suppose the variation that I want is that every time I go to add something to the list, I want it to add two of that. 
so that that, what, that way I get a list that's in a stuttered state. So instead of having four score, I want it to be four, four score, score, and, and seven, seven years, years ago. So I want this add method to behave differently than it does right now. Now, you could imagine that what I'd do is I'd go and I'd find the array list class, and I would go into the class and change add so that it has a different definition. That would be like doing surgery on the array list class. Well, for one thing, you may not have access to the array list class, and no one wants you to do that anyway. You're not supposed to go in and screw up the array list class. I mean, you could make a copy of the whole thing and have your own version, but that's kind of not, not a good idea either because then you're not connected to the original. So what we want to do is to have this additive change, some kind of minor uh, extra thing. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a new Java file. I'm going to, I'm going to have to do a job, import of java.util.star to have access uh, to the various list things. I'm going to have a public class that I'm going to call stuttered list of E that extends uh, array list of E. So I'm going to use an inheritance relationship. Let me go ahead and save this as stuttered list.java and uh, let me compile it. Uh, so it's empty. There's nothing in it whatsoever. But remember that one of the things that I mentioned is that one of the things to understand is that when you inherit, that, that basically means you're a pretty, you can be a pretty interesting object just through the inheritance relationship. A stuttered list can do all the things that an array list can do just because it extends it. So let me go ahead and compile, just show you if I compile and run, I mean, it's behaving exactly the way the array list did. So I can make my own list, and just by saying extends, I get all of that state and behavior. I get something that, that solves the array list problem. It does all of that stuff. Now, what I want to do is I want a variation on what it normally does. So uh, I want to deal with the add method. Uh, in our array int list, we added a value of type int. What are we doing here? We would be adding a value of type e, because this is the generic version. So adding a value of type E, how do we get it to add it twice? I mean, you might think you say add value, add value. You know, that would be one way to think of it. That should add it twice, right? No. Uh, that's the add method. And how, what does the add method do? It calls the add method, which calls the add method, which calls the add method, which calls the add method. That's an infinite recursion. When that first infinite recursion is done, it'll do a second infinite recursion. So that's not the way to do it. How would we do it? Well, we saw last time that uh, if you're overriding a method, so here we're overriding the built-in add method, we can call the original version of the method by saying super dot. So I can do super dot add, super dot add. I want the array list version of add to be executed twice for my version of add. That's basically what I'm saying. If I compile, I get a strange little error message that it mentions that the add method uh, uh, has, a, has a different return type. It returns a Boolean. So basically, this is a kind of a weird thing you find out the more you do this kind of thing, you discover things about uh, the built-in classes. Uh, it, it has to do with the way that this is all put together with different kinds of collections, that it turns out that add is something where uh, this structure actually kind of has the option of ignoring you and saying, no, I don't want to add. So you can kind of return a Boolean that says whether or not you actually add it. Now, an array list can always add, so this is always going to return true. But there are other variations, you know, other kinds of structures that sometimes you know, will return a false to basically say, uh, no, I'm not able to add the thing you asked me to add. So it's kind of letting you know whether it succeeded. Now, with an array list, we know it's always going to succeed. Uh, but uh, we had to kind of understand that in order to be able to know how to properly override uh, that structure. And if I come here now and compile uh, and run this version of the program, what I get is something that does four, four, score, score, and, and, seven, seven years ago, years, years ago. So uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I look at that and I'm like, wow, that's super short. That's an additive change. That's basically a real bare bones description of the change. I am making a variation of array list. My variation does something different for add. What it does for add is it does two calls on the super.add. So with a very short little class here, 
I was able to create a variation that does something very interesting. And of course, you know, especially since I use the interface type, I don't have to change anything else in the program. You know, the only place I need to change anything is in the constructor, you know, the, what I'm calling new, when I say that the kind of list I want is a stuttered list. Uh, and then everything else, all of the other code that I write will, will work properly uh, because a stuttered list will be of that type. Okay, so that's one example. I wanted to give you an example that involves a little bit more, uh, and so there's some more issues that come into play, because that one was particularly simple. So let's look at one that's a little more complicated. The idea is that I want to create some point objects. So point was used in chapter eight, and 142 we used it as the example for classes, an XY coordinate, you know, points on a screen is typically what we're thinking of, you know, uh, coordinates, you know, they're, they're integer coordinates. Uh, uh, location on, on a screen. Uh, and there's a translate method that these point objects have that says to kind of move the point around on the screen. So you give it a delta x and a delta y. I want you to change its x by a certain amount and change its y by a certain amount. So move it, move the point. Well, suppose that I, you know, so here I'm setting up a couple of points and I'm translating their coordinates. What if I wanted to know how many times the point had been translated. That's not a method of the point class, so that's not something that's provided by the point class. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up my own custom class that I'm gonna call my point. So I'm gonna make a new Java class. I'm gonna import from java.awt.star, that's the graphics uh, uh, set of utilities. And I'm gonna have a public class called my point that extends the built-in point class. And the idea is that I want it to have an extra field, so it'll have the XY. It has all of the stuff that a point has. It inherits the state and behavior of a point, but I want it to have an extra counter that's gonna keep track of how many times uh, the translate method has been called. So that means that the translate method that takes an X and a Y, uh, I'm gonna to wanna to count how many times it gets called. So that's what I want my version to do, is to keep track of that count. But I still want to do the translate command, so I'm going to say super.translate. So I'm going to have the super class, the original point class, do the translate the way it normally does, but I'm going to add the extra line of code, count plus plus. And then I'm going to have a public int get translate count uh, that will return that count. So, if you think about what kind of surgery I would have done, so like suppose I, I wanted to make invasive change. I would have taken the point class, made a copy of it, and I would have gone in and added an extra field, added this count plus plus in the translate method, added this method that returns the count. Those are the changes I would have made to the point class, but why do surgery on an existing class? Much better to make a brand new class that extends that class. Leave point alone. Point's already done, it's debugged, no one should be changing point. We just wanna have our variation. And so we basically describe how it's different. That's what inheritance allows us to do. Uh, I believe this is gonna compile, oh, oh yeah, I wanted to save it, so let me go ahead and save this. Uh, it's not gonna quite work. There's another issue that comes up. Uh, oh, I wanted to save it as my point dot. Java, uh, and then let's go ahead, uh, oh, and then uh, let me compile. And, uh, oh, I didn't have, I, 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 uh, for some reason I mistyped, I didn't put the Y here. So let's compile. So it compiles, but if I go back over to the client code and I try compiling, I'm gonna get some error messages here. It's, it's unhappy with the constructor. So it, 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 actually the first one worked, but the second one didn't. So remember how constructors work. And there is an important point in all of this, which is that uh, when you use inheritance, you inherit the state and behavior, but you don't inherit constructors. So what do we have here? It, when you, there's no constructors at all. So that means that Java will give us a default zero argument constructor. So it's kind of doing that. But if I wanted to have a constructor, my point, that takes an X and a Y, then I have, to, I have to have that. I have to actually have both of these constructors if I want to, in my client code, 
be able to use two different constructors. So constructors are not inherited. There's a, a subtle issue that comes up here, which is that this is, you know, it inherits the state and behavior, so it does inherit an X and a Y, but in general, this class would not have access to that X and that Y. Normally, they'd be private fields. They'd be encapsulated in the point class. So how do we set them? How do we set up the original X and Y? Well, uh, when you use inheritance, uh, one of the things that's understood is that you can call a superclass constructor. So I want to, you know, so basically my, this, this thing called my point is an extension of a point, but inside of it is a point object with an X and a Y. How do I construct the inside part, the point part of it? Well, I do that by using a call on super with parens. That's calling a superclass constructor. So I can call the superclass constructor passing it the X and the Y. Uh, so uh, one of the things that's true of constructors is if you don't put anything here in terms of a call on a superclass constructor, Java will include one for you for free. So the superclass constructor is always called uh, whether you, you have an explicit call or not. Uh, but here we would basically be saying set up the X and the Y uh, by calling the point classes constructor that takes an X and a Y. And here I could say set the count to be zero. I mean, that's what Java's going to do when it initializes the field, is it'll set it to be zero anyway, but it's not bad to be explicit. Here I could do a call on the superclass constructor, but I'm actually going to do a call on the other constructor. I'm going to use that notation where this is kind of where I'll put all of my uh, constructing code, and I'll have this one call that. Uh, with the zero argument con constructor should be setting up a point zero zero. So let me try compiling this version, and we'll come back over to our client code and see if the client code compiles now. And it did, and when we run it, it shows these point objects that, that P1 and P2, and P1 had a translate count of two, and P2 had a translate count of one. That's exactly right, right? We called P1's translate twice, and we called P2's translate uh, once. So that, though, those are the right counts uh, to have uh, for the translation. So again, I mean, there was more work involved because we had to understand kind of how to call superclass constructors. But in general, uh, uh, this is still a fairly minimal class that I've created here uh, that creates a variation on a point that does something extra that it didn't do before. Okay, I wanna, so I mean, uh, variations again. Var that's what, uh, that's what uh, inheritance is particularly good at. Um, I wanted to show you one more example. Um, in, the, in the mid 80s, uh, object-oriented programming was becoming popular at universities. A lot of times though, what we do at universities is not necessarily picked up in industry, but at that time they did pick up what we were doing because there was something that was happening that turned out to be kind of the killer app for, uh, for inheritance, which is that the Macintosh had come out in 1984, Windows uh, came uh, soon after that, and people were having to write code to do graphical user interfaces. And people were kind of like, I don't wanna have to write the code for a slider and a window and resizing and drawing and all of this kind of stuff. I want to just do my minor variations on that. And so that's why the object-oriented programming was a particularly useful thing to do. In fact, uh, at, at uh, Apple at the time, they created a program that they called Mac App, which they described as the program that does nothing in just the right way. So it didn't do anything, but it had all these hooks, all these places where you could kind of uh, uh, override behavior to get it to do something interesting. So uh, I wanted to show you that because the original version of AWT uh, has things that do that. So um, I have something here called DrawFrame, uh, which is using the AWT, the, the original graphics that Java used. Uh, and I want us to kind of uh, do some variations on this. So I'm gonna go ahead and compile and run this. It sets up a frame. When I run it, do you see a frame on the screen? I didn't see a frame on the screen. Uh, well, that's because I didn't mention that you have to say set visible to true if you want a frame to actually show up. So if I compile and run it, uh, 
Do you see a frame? Any frame here? Well, actually it is here in this upper left corner right here. What I didn't mention is that by default, frames have a, have, have a default size of zero, zero. So how about if we set the size to 600, 600? There's, there's several things you can set. You can set its title to be uh, CSE 143 is fun, you know. Uh, you can set its background color. How about if we set it to color.cyan? So there are a lot of things that you can do with a frame just by doing calls on set, 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 set. Uh, but, you know, only so many things that you can do that way. But this sets up, you know, now a somewhat more interesting application. CSE 143 is fun, fun. it's got a background color of cyan. But if I want to do more, I kind of have to do something more sophisticated. Well, it turns out this frame class is something that does nothing in just the right way is you know, kind of a way of looking at it. Let me end this version of it. So what you tend to do is you tend to make a custom frame class. So uh, over here, I have a custom frame that's going to extend frame. And so what you tend to do is to override various methods. Like there's a method called paint. What if, oh, that takes a graphics object, G. What if we override paint? And for now, how about if we just do system.out.println, we'll say paint, uh, paint. You know, we'll just print, it, print that out when it's doing a paint. So let me compile that one. Let me come over here and recompile so it uses our custom frame. And if I resize this thing, look at all the calls that are happening on paint here. So every time you resize, it's calling paint. In fact, I could come over here to my custom frame and I could introduce a private int count and I could do something like this. I could do count plus plus and I could say paint count equals and I could kind of have it show me how many times it's been painted. Uh, I could use that graphics G object to do some things like I could draw a string. How about if I if I do hello world uh, at coordinates 50, 50. Uh, I could do something like setting the color uh, to color dot yellow. You know, so how about if we're gonna do a little drawing in yellow and I'll do a fill uh, rect, let's say, uh, at, uh, I don't know, 50, 100, and we'll make it a 40 by 40 yellow square. Uh, oh, let's do an oval. I think a circle's more fun, so let's do a, uh, oops, uh, no, that, uh, that should have been the set color, but uh, I wanted to do a fill oval instead of a fill rect. Uh, let me recompile this and come back over here and we'll run it again. And now there's my hello world text and there's my little yellow circle. And now as I resize, it's showing you how many times it's repainting, which is a lot of times. So it kind of does a lot. Um, well, the next thing I wanted to do is what happens if I go click, 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 click at various points uh, uh, on, the, on, on the surface here? I want it to draw a little blue dot every time I do that. Well, I can do that by overriding a method, public boolean mouse press, that takes an event object E, an int X, and an int Y, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, give me a graphics G by calling a get graphics uh, object. And I'm going to do G.setColor to color.blue. And I'm going to do G.fill an oval uh, at the at kind of those X, Y coordinates that's a 10 by 10. But some of you who remember uh, graphics may remember that kind of to have a centered, you know, a centered oval, we do minus 5 here. You know, because this is, this is, because uh, uh, it draws in the, you know, that's the upper left corner. We're specifying the upper left corner. Uh, if I compile this version and run it, it's warning me, by the way, that I'm using old stuff, but it's just a warning. Oops. Oh, not, excuse me, I had, I, I, I did the wrong, the wrong method here. Uh, what I wanted to do was mouse down, not mouse press. What am I thinking? got to override the right method in order for it to work. Uh, oops. I think I'm going to be able to maybe just show you this one little part of it. Uh, and then I'll, I'll actually do a little more at the beginning of Friday's lecture. Uh, let's run this version of it. And now when I click, uh, 